We are in week three of a series we launched uh, two weeks ago uh, called That's My King, and we are making our way through the first three books of the book of Revelation. And if you are new to church, you're, you're not a Christian, uh, this is going to be fascinating for you. This is a book that uh, is perplexing and causes a lot of people, even those who are very seasoned in their faith, uh, to scratch their head. The book of Revelation is a humbling book. Can I get an amen? It's a humbling book. And there is so much vivid imagery and uh, prophecy. It's apocalyptic literature. And it uh, was not only relevant for the original readers and hearers of this letter, I believe that the messages within it uh, are timeless and for, for the church. As we said in the opening week of this, uh, the book of Revelation, it is clothed and drenched in Scripture. Uh, it is hard to fully grasp a deep handle or understanding of the book of Revelation uh, if you don't have a foundation of God's word. And this is often perplexing to some, but I would just say as your pastor, uh, many of you, when you're reading the Bible, you're reading too much. You, you really have to slow down, uh, especially when it comes to a book like this one that is apocalyptic in its genre. It, it takes a while to adjust to what you're reading. And don't be in a rush to get through it if anything, just enjoy the process of it getting through you. And God's word is, is fascinating. And the book of Revelation is uh, a treasure, I think, for the local church. And it uh, right away opens our eyes to the reality that there is more taking place around us than we realized. There is more taking place around us than we realized. In fact, in this moment right now, every single one of us comes in here uh, off of some sort of week, whether that was a good week or a bad week. We all come in here with different thoughts, feelings, experiences. A lot is happening just in the last week of our lives. Does that make sense? And a lot of times we don't live aware of that. We live very attuned to our individual experience, not realizing so many other things are taking place simultaneously. Is that making sense? Uh, have you ever had a strange week? Anyone in here coming off of a strange week? It's like, man, that one was bewildering. How about a painful week? Anyone in here coming off of a painful week? It's okay to admit that. Uh, how many of you are coming off of just an awesome week? Joy, God is good. Yeah, don't be ever embarrassed to celebrate God's goodness. All of us are coming in differently, right? I'm coming off of a strange week. And... I don't know about you, but I tend to be a hypochondriac to the extreme level. Wave at me if you're a hypochondriac. Like if I am talking to a person in London over the phone and they tell me they have lice, I get lice immediately. <laughs> Anyone else, your head starts itching. I'm a hypochondriac and to make matters worse, I self-diagnose. I play doctor often and I like to examine my own symptoms. The other day I was doing my hair and I felt this bump on the back of my head to which I decided to WebMD bump on the back of my head. Within 15 minutes, I've gone dark. I, I'm convinced I'm dying and I've now got this massive tumor on the back of my head. So I, I scheduled a doctor's appointment and Kristen says, you know, babe, you're turning 40 this month. Uh, you never go to the doctor this would be a good opportunity for you to just have them do a once-over. Which for the record, gentlemen, especially if you're young, a once-over means go have a very awkward experience, is what that means. <laughs> so I go into the doctor, and they check out the bump on the back of my head, and praise God, it's nothing. It's just a cyst, there's nothing to it. But while I was there, they discovered some cancer on my face. And just by the providence of God, you go in for one thing and it's another. And immediately they say, now, if you're going to get cancer, this is the very best kind you should get, <laughs> which I appreciated. That's the first time you hear the C word, you don't really know how to feel. It feels a certain way. So 
they have to remove this, this bump on my face. And the guy's like, hey, the good news is, is you've got this wrinkle now that we can tie it right into the wrinkle. They won't even see it. And uh, which is hilarious, because after I told the story of the first service, some lady came up to me in the lobby and she was like, I want to see that scar. And she started looking up here and she goes, I can't even see it. And I'm like, no, it's right here. And she goes, oh, you have a wrinkle up here too. Shots fired. So anyways, I, I go in, they, they cut out this, this bump on my face. I get 10 stitches right down the center of my face. And I, I'm thinking to myself like, okay, I should take a week off from preaching. No one's gonna wanna look at this ugly mug with stitches or Band-Aid. And the moment I mentioned doing a series on Revelation, Kristen immediately was like, well, Pastor Steve has to speak in our book uh, series on Revelation. You need his voice in this study, which didn't he do a wonderful job last week? I just thought he was outstanding. So we said, all right, well, we'll take the week off. We will take advantage of it being fall break for our kids as well. Let's, let's take a trip. So I go and I get this procedure done and the lady says, okay, you need to come back on Monday to get your stitches out. To which I said, well, there's a problem. We're gonna be out of town on Monday. To which she says, not a problem. Here's a kit. Um, either your wife or yourself could remove these pretty effortlessly. It's easy. I do it all the time. Take the kit with you. Um, I walk out of the doctor's office immediately knowing that's not an option. <laughs> Me or Kristen playing doctor? No way. But they had also said, you know, it does, you know, this is a pretty common standard thing. You go into any urgent care wherever you're at, and they can remove the stitches. Now, if you work in the medical field in any capacity, would you just raise your hand so we can just celebrate and acknowledge you? Come on, look at all the individuals across all of our locations who serve in the medical field. Well, what I discovered this last week is medical care in Indiana is better, significantly better than medical care in California. Oh my goodness gracious. So I get out there, Monday comes, and I'm like, all right, I gotta go get these stitches out. So I go to this urgent care, and guys, I'm there for two hours. At one point, there's a doctor in the room and three nurses, and they're all hovering over me, looking at my face. I'm texting Kristen, I'm like, babe, I, I have no idea what's going on right now. And finally, the doctor comes in, he says, here's the problem. Most people when they do stitches. Now, I'm just repeating what he says. I don't know if any of this is accurate or medically true. I'm just saying this is what the doctor told me. He said, most people when they do stitches, they tie a knot, they weave it through, they tie a knot on the other side. They tie a knot, they weave it through, they tie a knot on the other side. One stitch at a time. He said, well, clearly your dermatologist was next level. He did it all with one thread. And we don't know how to remove that kind of stitch. What do you mean, doctor? You don't know how to remove. That would be like you showing up with the Bible and me being like, I don't know how to teach that. <laughs> so he, he says, here's the thing. We're, we're afraid of trying to pull it in one piece that we might pull apart the incision. No one in our office is confident enough that they can remove the stitches. To which I say, okay, pal, um, what are my options? If you can't take out my stitches. He said, you might want to try another urgent care. So I do that. I go to this other urgent care, and they're like, look, we, we, we close at six, and there's a pretty long line ahead of you. And just to save you time, if that's what they told you down the street, there's a good chance we're going to be in the same place. We can't take out those stitches. So I get out in the parking lot, and I call Kristen, and I'm like, babe, I have, I have no idea like, what to do. These stitches have to come out today. And I look across the parking lot and there's this dentist office. <laughs> and I think to myself, well, dentists do stitches. So I walk into this dental office and this poor girl's behind the counter and she's really doing good at her job. And, and I walk up to her and I start explaining to her my predicament. Guys, I probably look nuts. Walking up to this poor young lady and saying, hey, so... I got this cut in my face seven days ago in Indiana. I've been to two medical facilities that won't take it out, but can you guys do so? And she politely tells me, hey, I don't know if you noticed on the way in, 
We're a dental office, <laughs> not a dermatologist. And as we're having this conversation, this, I see the dentist walk by in the back hallway. And have you ever had a moment where it's like, sometimes you just have to take matters into your own hands. <laughs> this is life or death for me. I don't know what this means. Fella, can I talk to you for 30 seconds? So he comes over and I, and I tell him the situation. And this is what he says. He says, okay, I'll do it, but I don't wanna run it through my books, so you gotta pay me $200 cash. <laughs> and so your pastor got hustled by a crooked dentist <laughs> in California. And I walked away thinking like, I don't even know if what I did was illegal and if I should be in trouble. This will be my canceling this week. This guy did this. And um, that's all that just happened in seven days. And I'm one person in this large church of individuals all going through things every single day. Good, bad, strange, bizarre, random, bewildering, painful, exciting, peaceful experiences all coming in as one to not recognize that as, as we sit, there is more taking place around us in the lives of individuals and the things in life than we at times realize. Now you take that into consideration and you multiply it by a thousand and that is what is happening in the spiritual realm. The book of Revelation pulls no punches and quickly arrives at the first conclusion that there is something happening in the spiritual and there is a supernatural reality taking place simultaneously to life as we know it. And I, I really never know what to say in these type of conversations. I often feel uh, sometimes unprepared or lacking confidence when talking about the supernatural. There are parts of it that are very bizarre to me. That said, there, there's no question. There, there's no question there is a supernatural spiritual reality to life that is taking place simultaneously. As weird as that is and as strange as it is to get your mind around it, I believe that. And what Revelations does is it says, yeah, what is happening in the spiritual is casting a significant shadow on what you're currently experiencing in the temporal. This is significant, and there comes this, this vision, this prophecy, this artistic explanation of the end of all things and what's to come. And John writes a letter instructed by Christ to seven churches. John is going through horrific torture, persecution. He's imprisoned on an island. Things could not be worse. He's writing a letter to people who are arriving at the same conclusion, the Roman Empire with its corruption and wickedness and evil and immorality and idolatry is creating absolute chaos and devastation for the people of God. And Jesus comes to John and gives him a message to send to churches in that predicament. Now, what's amazing is John hears this voice and, and he turns and he sees Jesus. In week one, where did we say Jesus was standing? Chapter one, you gotta read it. It says Jesus is within and among the seven golden lampstands. Big imagery, we talked about it in week one. The seven golden lampstands, they represent what? The church. And one of the church's primary functions is to shine light on King Jesus. The Primary function is that. And so John turns, and where does he find Christ? Among the church. It's, it's great. And what does Christ first do? Speaks to the church. I, I don't know what it's like for you, but I, I'm, I'm guessing you can relate to some degree that there come moments in life where you look at the evil and the devastation, the hatred, the wickedness, all the things in culture and the world around us that jar your soul in a very negative way. 
wars around the world, potential additional wars being added, uh, things taking place socially at an alarming rate. And this creates turbulence for all of us. Whether you're a Christian or not, you feel the turbulence. But as Christians, don't you ask the question, where is Jesus in all of this? Have have you ever looked at culture, our society, the world around us, your situation and thought, where's Jesus in all of this? That's a question of a mature believer. Despite what swirls about, despite the things of our world, we live with an awareness and a confidence that we serve Emmanuel, God with us, who will never leave us nor abandon us, and he doesn't leave his children as forgotten orphans. But he is a remarkable God who is with us. And so it's learning to ask the question, where? is Jesus in all of this. John turns to see Christ in a moment where John and his original readers would have been asking the question, where's Jesus in all this? And John's first glimpse of Jesus is where? Among the church. That is a wonderful reminder, a a tender mercy, a beautiful image, and a resounding echo of what we find in scripture that our God is present. Right now, our God is present. God is with us. That is the incarnation of Christ bringing heaven to earth. God is with us. And he's among the church. He is among the fellowship of believers. And and so if you're, you're new to Northview, you should know when we gather every single week, this is in many ways what informs or inspires, postures, as well as produces our worship and anticipation for these type of gatherings. We show up to gather and dive into God's word and to worship our heavenly father because we believe he's among us. We believe our God is with us. And that's, that's wonderful. You, you need to know that our savior is remarkably faithful and despite what comes our way, he's with us. I think his faithfulness may be one of his most overlooked attributes. There's this side to God that uh, gets taken for granted. His long suffering, his forbearance, his patience, his faithfulness. Have you ever been amazed by how patient God is with you? You're a lot of work. You take a lot of time and energy. So do I. And isn't it amazing that by his grace, he just faithfully and patiently walks alongside us as we figure this thing called life out? He's a good God. He's not concerned with the speed of your growth. He's concerned with the strength of your growth. And as a father who appreciates their kid as a toddler, a teenager, an adult, he enjoys this season of life with you. No matter where you're at in your development with Christ, Your heavenly father enjoys this season with you. Enjoy it back with him. And John writes this letter to these churches. And today we're gonna look at the the church in Smyrna. And it's only four verses. And here's what he writes to the church in Smyrna. He says, to the angel of the church in Smyrna, write, these are the words of him who is the first and the last who died and came to life again. I know your afflictions and your poverty, yet you are rich. I love that. I know about the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. We're going to read that again. Look look at this loaded statement that Christ makes. He says, I know about the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not but are a synagogue of Satan. I've joked around and said before, I want to do a series called Skinny Jeans. Subtitle being, all the uncomfortable statements of Christ. This is an uncomfortable statement of Christ, a synagogue of Satan. He goes on to say, do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison 
to test you and you will suffer persecution for 10 days, but be faithful even to the point of death. Wow, those are strong words. And I will give you life as your victor's crown. I think that's a life verse for some people. And I will give you life as your victor's crown. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who is victorious will not be hurt at all, there's another big idea, by the second death. So again, that's only four verses and already there's a thousand questions in the room. What is this intended to mean? And what you'll find as you study the church in Smyrna, the church in Smyrna is known as the persecuted church. If you ever do a deep dive, it is known as the persecuted church. And a, a lot of people facing persecution around the world identify and take their cues and are inspired by the church of Smyrna. It is what is pictured alongside the definition in the dictionary of persecuted church, essentially. And Smyrna was known in the Roman Empire as the crown of the empire. It was a port city, beautiful place, and it was affluent, and it was highly attracted to a diverse population, and there was this bustling culture taking place in Smyrna, and it was a great place for everyone to live apart from Christians. Anything went, but this Christianity thing is an issue. And Smyrna was facing uh, persecution. I, I sometimes never know how to address certain things when it comes to the global church that I think are important for all of us to know as believers in Christ, brothers and sisters in the family of God, as to what other believers around the world are currently facing to this very moment. Persecution has always been a part of the church's story. Persecution is happening today as we speak around the world, and persecution has been happening against the local church from day one. And I think at a minimum, we don't have to exhaust the overwhelming, gut-wrenching details of some of this persecution, but at a minimum, as brothers and sisters in Christ, we should develop the practice of praying for believers around the world what we would view as resistance to our faith cannot compare to what real soldiers in the army of God deal with in the trenches and in the foxholes of very hostile environments. Smyrna was one of those environments. Imprisonment, uh, death, these things were always hanging in the balance as a possibility for those who claim to follow Christ. And Christ sends them a message. And what is his message? Let's go back to that verse, Mandy, if you have it. He says, I know your afflictions and your poverty, yet you are rich. I know about the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but a synagogue of Satan. And we can just leave this one up here for a second. So he starts out, he says, I know exactly what you're going through. I know your afflictions. Now, when Jesus says that, his level of empathy is something none of us have the capabilities of extending to others. He is empathetic to an extreme degree. And he says, I know your afflictions. Every thought, every feeling, the entire experience, I'm fully aware of it. And he goes on to clarify what they're going through. And he says, there are some among you who say they are Jews but they are a synagogue of Satan. And why are they a synagogue of Satan? Because they're spreading lies. The Bible tells us the devil is the father of lies. And, and so he says, this is what's happening. So when you think about persecution and say, hey, let's do a study on the persecuted church. Okay, let's go to scripture and look at the persecuted church. Well, here's what you find. They were being persecuted by a group of individuals claiming to be Jews, spreading false reports and slanderous narratives within the church. That's, 
that was the persecution. Isn't that strange to think about? When, when we think about persecution, consider this. When we think about persecution, we think of external forces, outside forces attacking the church. We think of culture and we think of all the different agendas in the world that run against the grain of our convictions. When we think of persecution, don't you think of those matters? But when it comes to the persecuted church that had every right to focus on external matters, Jesus says, no, no, no. The real issue is internal. They are facing persecution from the inside. There are casualties due to friendly fire. That's, that's wild to think about. Christ comes to the persecuted church and he says, no, here's what's happening. People are being picked off by friendly fire by those who claim to be a part of the family of God. They're facing persecution from the inside. Maybe the whole idea is the greatest form of relational pain and the greatest form of relational persecution is when it is done by people you know, people you trust, and people who claim to be godly. You ever been hurt by a godly person? Let down by someone who claims to be a Christian? Let down by a pastor, a leader, someone in your small group, a kid your child attended youth group with? You ever had an experience in church where you left hurt, disappointed, marked negatively by someone else in the family of God claiming to be a godly person? And that is the person, it's wild to think about, but that is what Jesus is addressing in the church of Smyrna. And he, he wants them to know that if you're not aware of this, you could be detrimental to this community of faith um, if you lose heart and you don't stand your ground against some of the things you're facing. See, here, here's the thing that you have to understand when you go through scripture is when you and I look at the Jewish faith, Judaism, and the nation of Israel, and uh, the Jewish community, uh, we, we see a very clear distinction between Christianity and Judaism. It, it's not hard for most people to be like, yeah, so there's Judaism, and then there's Christianity, and here's how the two have this unique connection to one another. We see the distinction. In this time, when John's writing, they didn't see that distinction. Jesus was the Messiah, the fulfillment of all the prophecies and the law. Jesus was the one promised from the very beginning in the garden to Adam and Eve. He is the blessing that came through Abraham. There is, without a doubt, a uh, strong tie to the Jewish people in the nation of Israel. This is why we care so deeply uh, about them. It's, it's part of our heritage. When Jesus showed up, he didn't put a stake in the ground and say, I am here to start a new religion. I'm here to start what we're gonna call Christianity. That's not, that's not how it happened. Jesus didn't show up trying to start a new religion. He came to complete and fulfill and carry forward the ultimate plan of redemption for humanity. And the first time we ever even see the label Christian is the church in Antioch in the book of Acts, which is the first predominantly Gentile church, and the uh, community around them, mocking them, started calling them little Christ, those Christians. And over time, it just stuck, and we just redeemed it. Yeah, we're Christians. We're little Christ. But that's how the name came about. So when the church first gets started, people aren't thinking, hey, there's Christianity and there's Judaism. They're more so thinking there's a couple different kinds of camps of thought similar to what we're accustomed to. They had Sadducees and Pharisees, and now they're like, now there's this other group subscribing to this Rabbi Christ, where we would be familiar with Baptist and Lutheran. Does that make sense? There was, that was kind of in the mix. So they were viewed as Jews in Rome. And the Jewish people had only a fraction of religious rites in Smyrna, just a fraction. 
And so what you had is you had this uh, group of what you would probably refer to as traditional conservative Jews who did not fully align with Christ as Messiah, Savior of the world, and source of salvation. And so they were nervous about this influx of Gentiles joining the church and this movement of Christianity. They thought they were going to uh, be guilty by association with the Roman Empire. So here's what they decided to do. They started fabricating lies and rumors and false reports and slander about Christians in the church all to get them in trouble with the Roman Empire. Also that the Roman Empire would come in and imprison them. Isn't that wild to think about? The persecuted church had that from the inside. And again, this is a timeless message to the church. This is God's way of saying, as long as there's imperfect people attending my church and a part of my body of Christ, there's always going to be hiccups. And there's always going to be the tendency for some people to go sideways. And you have to keep in front of you the call, the challenge, the mandate to, to remain faithful. You have to remain faithful. But the challenge is very few things will disrupt your journey of faith, your relationship with Christ, and throw your theology through a ringer than by getting hurt by someone who says they're doing it in the name of God. And people have this experience. As a pastor, I, I hear more recently there's this phrase uh, where people will refer to church hurt, negative experiences that they had in church. And I do think sometimes we go a little overboard with this stuff. We get a label and then we exploit the thing until it's exhausted. Um, yes, there's painful experiences everywhere. I've got some sport hurt. Uh, I've got some church hurt. I've got some school hurt. I've got some home hurt. You, know, you got hurt, right? Um, but there are some people who have gone through painful things within the church. And I was thinking, man, I think the hardest thing sometimes to forgive is a place, not a person. Anyone who's ever experienced trauma actually understands that. I think situational forgiveness is much more complicated and a more sophisticated maneuver in grace than relational grace. I can forgive you, but the, the environment sometimes comes with triggers. It's harder to forgive a space that represents a painful experience. Is that making sense? And so what is tragic to me is people are walking away from the faith because they have been marked painfully due to situations taking place within the church across all churches. And they're walking away from the faith because they can't re-enter a space they've yet to find the ability to apply grace to. And I thought, you know, maybe this weekend, I, I just need to stand publicly in front of our church and whoever's watching online and, and just extend uh, a, a sincere apology from one imperfect pastor who understands and is disappointed by the fact that at times, leaders, individuals who serve in roles like mine, make decisions, lead in certain ways that impact people negatively. There are leaders who have caused hurt for some adhering to the faith and a part of the body of Christ. And regardless of the fact that I was not involved in your experience, maybe it would be of some benefit as a pastor nonetheless to just say, hey, I'm legitimately sorry for the things you've experienced and the letdowns and the disappointments you've had to encounter within the church. And as a pastor, uh, I, I pray you can forgive flawed leaders even like myself. And I would just ask for your grace moving forward if Northview becomes your church. Um, guys, I see a lot of room for improvement in the mirror. I just do. I, I'm not a perfect leader. I'm so thankful for the ones who 
have allowed me graciously over the last 20 years to learn how to be a pastor at their expense. You know, I'm thankful for your guinea pigs. It's like, hey, would you just let me try this out? Man, when I first got started, I was terrible, but I, uh, I'm thankful. I'm sure I let down people. And I'm sure there's some times that I disappointed or, and it's just learning to recognize your contribution to the matter. Drama, dysfunction, pain, agony can happen within the church uh, by those who lead it as well as those who attend it. There's a great book called The Tale of Three Kings. It's a parable about the era in history that encompassed King Saul, King David, and David's son, Absalom. The whole tension centers around the throne and who should be king. And The premise of the book is what do you do when godly people hurt you? Immediately it establishes Saul as this maniacal king. Saul is having a hard time sleeping. They bring in David, the shepherd boy, to play the harp to try to put him to rest. Saul mistreats David. Saul is found to be picking up spears, throwing them at David. David is ducking the spears and continuing to play the harp. And as you read it, Every single one of us is likely to immediately identify with David. Something in us always identifies with the victim before the villain first. We should all just pay attention to that. Something in us always thinks we're the, vil- uh, the victim, never the villain. And we look at David and we're like, hey, I can relate to having what felt like spears thrown at me. And the temptation for David is every time a spear is thrown at David, isn't the temptation to pick it up and throw it back? Come on, anyone want to throw some spears back? But here's the revelation of the book. The moment King David picks up the spear and throws it back, he becomes King Saul. I hate to admit it, but there's some King Saul in all of us. And there's two statements that Gene Edwards makes in the book, one pertaining to leaders and one pertaining to people who attend churches. And I think it's important to read both. One, so you have language around some of this stuff so you can be a contributing healthy member of our church. But two, So you know what to expect of those who you are entrusting to lead your family spiritually. This is what you should expect of me as your pastor. You should just think of those ways. He says, rules were invented. This is to the leaders. Rules were invented by elders so they could get to bed early. Same thing with parenting. Men who speak endlessly on authority only prove They have none. Men who speak extensively on authority only prove they have none. And kings who make speeches about submission only betray twin fears in their hearts. They are certain they are not true leaders. Sent of God. Right? He goes on to tell us this. And they live in mortal fear of rebellion. No, Authority from God is not afraid of challenges, makes no defense, and cares not one whit if it must be dethroned. It's saying true godly healthy leaders, they just hold loosely what they've been entrusted to and steward because what the Lord gives, the Lord can take away. I'm not entitled to any of this. It is only by the grace of God that God gave a microphone to a broken person to share the good news of the gospel. And as long as I get to do it, great, God, but you don't owe me this. I'm not entitled. I hold it loosely. I'm gonna try to steward it my best. But there should never be posturing and dysfunctional toxicity within the church. And a lot of times that's represented in the leader. No, no, no. We can't do that. We can't do that. He goes on to say about those who attend the church. He says, in the spiritual realm, talking about the community of believers, a man who will lead a rebellion has already proven, no matter how grandiose his words or angelic his ways, that he 
has a critical nature and an unprincipled character. Man, what a statement. An unprincipled character. When I see people lash out at Christians and attack at the local church at scale, I think unprincipled character. And hidden motives in his heart. Frankly, he is a thief and he creates dissatisfaction and tension within the realm. And then either seizes power or siphons off followers. The followers he gets, he used to found his own dominion. Now watch how he closes it. Such a sorry beginning. Built on the foundation of insurrection, no, God never honors division in his realm. Guys, here's the thing. You're gonna bump into this all the time in your journey with faith. Jesus would say it this way. This is how they will know you are my disciples, by how you love one another. What Jesus is saying is when we allow our character to go sideways and we start to participate in things that are harmful to the bride of Christ, Jesus uses some of his strongest language and he says, that's a synagogue of Satan. In other words, people who do that are being pastored by the devil. Isn't that a strong word? He comes to the persecuted church and he says, no, greater is he that's within you than he that's within the world. Your concern is not the world around you. Your concern is you Christians have got to learn how to treat each other better. And over the last five years, haven't you found yourself embarrassed by some of the things taking place within the church? Christians fighting over the most bizarre things. We're fighting over politics. We're dividing over COVID and whether we should wear masks. And you go on down the list of things and we have all these different camps that are now at odds with each other. So much so, we even separate by our churches. And none of this honors God. None of this honors God. And Christ is saying, hey, would you tell them to not lose hope every time they're marked painfully by an imperfect person or someone who chooses to do wrong in the body of Christ? But would you encourage them to remain faithful and trust that it'll be worth it in the end? Because I know their afflictions. How does he know our afflictions? Because Jesus Christ was paraded through town, handed over, celebrated by the chief priest who orchestrated his execution. When he says, hey, I know what it's like to be hurt by a godly person, he's saying, yeah, I know your afflictions. They pierced me to a tree. Do not lose heart. This life comes with pain and sadly to say, Sometimes that's found within the local church. But if you will remain faithful, you find that God is faithful through it all. And that's where he ends and he says, and we will not be harmed by a second death. That death is now a passage, not a prison. And we are not forever eternally separated from God uh, in what Revelation would refer to as the second death. Church, Let's be Christians who treat each other better. How simple would that be? The world needs Christians. The church needs Christians. The next generation needs Christians. Your kids, they need Christians. You need Christians. I need Christians who treat each other better, who have the maturity to stay in a dialogue who understand the complexities that come with being in relationship with broken people, but are committed to one another and through the process as we all try to figure this thing out. Because in case you're wondering, even as your pastor walking this journey of faith myself, 
there are some things I'm still figuring out. That's what makes it faith. You're always going to have to trust. We don't graduate from